Having this true curiosity on the Randy Show. In your eyes, hmm. how powerful a geopolitical power is Iran truly? Hmm. Because if you go to geopolitics 101, it basically boils down to your economic advantages, your resource-based advantages. I would argue your population-based advantages and your technological advantages. Fair? Anything else you'd like to add to this? I would say it's also, it also, what also matters is the quality of your leadership and its willingness to take risks beyond your territory and within your territory. Territory. That also matters. You'd say that Iran is a geopolitical power to be considered as an impactful force on the world map? Or is it a puppet for one of the other traditional powers? Mm, that's a good question. So Iran, one could say, is a significant regional power in the Middle East. They can, if they can affect what's happening in Syria. They can affect what's happening in Lebanon. They can affect what's happening in Gaza in the West Bank. They can affect what's happening in Yemen. They can affect things that are happening in Iraq as well. Through their own spy networks and their own... Their proxies. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. they've got extensions of their own forces and they have uh, significant uh, influence in various countries. And it's not just soft power, it's hard power also. Okay, so th there is financial support, there is technical know-how, there is logistical support, there is arms and ammunition support. And there's also you could say military agents and maybe possibly plain clothes soldiers as well. Possibly. Okay, so Iran is a nation that operates beyond its borders. It is willing to operate beyond its borders. It's willing to take risks. It has a significant... Look, Iran hasn't seen a significant war since the 1980s, the Iran-Iraq war. And they have been developing their military. It, I'll tell you what. About half of the population of Iran is Persian. About half of it is Azerbaijani or Arab or whatever else. So you could say that Iran is kind of held in place, the government is held in place, kind of by, by force. One could say. By force. One could say. One could say it's a police state. Okay, look, it's for, let me give you a very crude example. You go to New York, hmm, you will see cop cars everywhere, you will see cops everywhere. You take those cops away for 15 minutes, there's going to be riots in New York, we know that. One could imagine the same kind of thing possibly happening in Iran as well, if you take away all the soldiers and all the cops. So much of the armed forces of Iran, one could say, some would say, are, are used to just enforce law and order and, and, and whatever else within the country. And, and some of that is obviously used for influencing um, outcomes in other nations. And they have a reasonably sophisticated military industrial uh, complex. They produce very good drones. The Russians are buying their drones in large quantities. They have missiles, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles of various kinds. They have, they have uh, drones and, 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 and they have a good... Uh, they don't have any shortage of arms and ammunition because they have not been involved in any, in any major ruinous war. And they have China on their side because China wants Iranian oil and energy. And obviously it makes sense for Russia to also align itself with Iran because Iran is, a pro, is, is, is an anti-US power and the biggest threat to Russia today is the US. That's how just the, the global geopolitical chessboard is loaded right now. So Iran is a significant power, significant regional power in this entire region. They dominate the Persian Gulf region. They can blockade the Strait of Hormuz at any time, which could cut off half the world's energy supplies right there. Right. So they are a significant power. They have a good navy and so on. And they are willing to take risks. And uh, they're always in the state of alert and state of, you know, kind of slightly paranoid nation. The paranoid government. nation. Everyone's out to get us. I mean, look at what happened to them. There's, there's a reason for them to be paranoid. The US used Saddam Hussein's Iraq against Iran to totally destroy Iran. Didn't work. But yeah, both nations were kind of half ruined by that war. And then the Americans imposed terrible sanctions on the Iranians. Medicines in short supply, everything in short supply. God knows how many Iranians died in that. And even now, we, the Iranians had signed this deal with the US. The, the, what is it called? The, the Iran nuclear agreement, which was uh, signed between Mr. Obama, between the regime, Obama regime and the Iranian regime. And Mr. Trump comes to power and he walks back from the agreement. And again, Iran is again a pariah and again, a, there are sanctions on them. So they don't trust the West. Once you sign an agreement, you got to honor that. Mm. Right? A deal, a treaty. The mm. treaty was not honored by the U.S. They walked back on it. So Iran doesn't trust the West and they have good reason not to trust the West. They and you See what happened to Mr. Soleimani. He was taken out in a drone strike in Baghdad. Uh, the U.S., <laughs> they are complaining about India allegedly trying to assassinate somebody 
on american soil a terrorist but they have no they, they are very upset about that but they are okay with uh, assassinating anybody anywhere they even assassinated mr anwar al awlaki allegedly a terrorist maybe a terrorist and his young son both us citizens in yemen the americans took them out with drone strikes their own citizens they took out mr uh, uh, un, what's his name soleimani they took out osama bin laden in abbottabad pakistan we have never seen evidence of that but they, that's what they claim and so on so the americans can do whatever they want there's a certain set of rules for them they said the same rules don't apply to other nations other nations have to uh, you know dance to a different set of rules and all that so that's a kind of double standards and hypocrisy that the americans are renowned for and that's kind of why they are losing respect in the world today especially as they because they are a declining power right now so yeah but coming back to your question that's why the iranians are paranoid they have good reason to be paranoid hmm it's a version of the best defense is to go on the offense yeah you have to so yeah. like muscle up to get ready uh it seems to me from the outside cinematically so that the middle east is getting ready at least iran seems like it's getting ready at the same time there is conflict so i would assume that uh a lot of the powers around the israel gaza conflict are also waking up in terms of everyone's on high alert that's the sense that we get sitting here in india based on the news we consume through media as well as twitter uh are we on the brink of a slight ex- escalation of the conflict or do you think uh it'll just kind of stay stable for lack of a better phrase just like the ukraine russia hmm. situation there's always the danger that this conflict could could escalate right now what's happening is that there is a bit of stability the americans have dispatched at least two aircraft carrier task forces in the mediterranean one in the mediterranean one in the arabian sea kind of region close to the persian gulf but not quite there so that they're kind of out of harm's way but these are there so the task force in the mediterranean it can always target hezbollah or hamas if required so that is there so that thing is always at the back of their minds you have another one in in the vicinity of the arabian sea region somewhere there which kind of kind of is a reminder to iran not to overplay their cards so they have tried to impose some stability through force in this manner the the problem is that iran israel has been trying to kind of you know make better relations mend defenses with certain of his neighbors it has a reasonably healthy relationship with egypt for example israel and egypt okay uh, the saudis want stability in the region the uae wants stability in the region but there's always the problem that you know if there is too much of uh, israeli action in a place like gaza for example or 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 the west bank of the river jordan which is on the other side of, of israel and if there are lots of civilian casualties then there may be this public outcry that these nations leaders would not be able to suppress and they would have to act on it if such a thing happens then one could so this is the extreme scenario i'm telling you an asymptotic scenario extreme scenario if something if if it goes beyond a certain point if certain red lines are crossed let's say like that then one could see a scenario in which all the arabic nations are forced to gang up and move on israel there's always the other angle which one doesn't talk about which is turkey now mr erdogan he has imperial ambitions of his own he has dreams and visions of reviving the ottoman caliphate the ottoman empire he is active in syria he is active in north africa the turkish troops they occupy about one third of of cyprus which is an island in the mediterranean east mediterranean so they also and they obviously mr erdogan and his party they express unstinting support for the palestinian cause and all that so there is this kind of dangerous neighborhood where everybody is kind of hoping nothing goes wrong but everybody is prepared if something happens we go all in that sort of thing and the problem the danger the real flashpoint is that israel is a nuclear power they are an undeclared nuclear power but everyone knows they have a number of nuclear weapons let's say three figures and they have something called the samson option which means that if all fails if all the missile defenses fail and if we are about to be overrun they will not go down alone they will take everybody down with them and that is a nightmare scenario so yeah it's it's a major flashpoint and it it all de- it just takes one misstep by somebody one bad de- decision by some leader or just some some accidental occurrence that could trigger off something really bad so the middle east is in that on that knife edge right now dangerous situation hmm uh the reason i'm even asking you this question in the first place is cuz i think recently one of the 
cabinet ministers of Israel actually made a statement against Iran. Now the thing is, uh, I would argue that a cabinet minister in a phase like this is a diplomat in many ways. And the messages you send out to other nations at the time of strife are thought out. It can't just be an emotional outburst. Mm -hmm. So I believe he said something like, um, we'll come for you, Iran, or something like that. Just type, uh, Israel ministers message to Iran. Did you see this statement? I haven't seen this. No, I have not. So it's kind of like what the Turks do. They keep reminding Greece. They could turn up one night. Yeah. Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu issues... To, oh, it was Netanyahu? Okay, then that's even more intense than what I was saying. I believe it was just a... I thought it was a cabinet minister. Apparently, it's the Prime Minister mm -hmm. who issues stern warning to Hezbollah and Iran. Do not test us. Israeli Prime Minister has delivered a forceful warning to both Hezbollah and Iran, cautioning them against any provocative actions. Oh, this was in October. Something more recent perhaps? Some, sorry, something recently has also happened. Mm -hmm. Either way, my point is, they are sending these strong messages to Iran. Obviously, the Mossad has some idea of something that's going to happen. These messages are coming out partially out of there. The PM of the country is like talking. Mm -hmm. What is happening? Yeah, so there is this wonderful, there is this interesting, not wonderful, interesting dynamic between Iran and Israel. So Iran calls Israel, no, they call the US. Shaitan e Bozorg, the great Satan. And they consider Israel to be an extension of the US or the other way around, whichever way they look at it. So the Iranian regime, they, well, their stated objective is to eradicate Israel from the map of the world. Okay, that's the kind of thing it is. So Israel sees Iran as an existential enemy. And I'm sure it's vice versa as well. So we have heard the news of various Iranian nuclear scientists dying you know, mysterious, mysterious deaths and all that. So it looks like Mossad has its hands in Iran. They even took out a nuclear reactor once, Osirak, in Iraq it was. Uh, I think it was the 80s or something. So the Israelis have these capabilities. They have a very powerful air force. They call it the IAF, the second IAF. We are the first IAF, they are the second IAF and so on. So there is this great amount of animosity, almost a kind of, uh, you know, it's it's like these these two are mortal enemies. So whenever something happens via Hamas or via Hezbollah or via somebody else, the Israelis probably know and they assume that it's coming from Iran, and they may take some actions to to you know retaliate against Iran itself possibly, maybe in a covert manner, maybe in an overt manner. If there's an overt war between Israel and Iran, it could be a nuclear war. I'm not sure about where Iran stands on the nuclear scale, but I would not be surprised if they have gone past the nuclear threshold by now. Because they had reasonably good uh, uranium enrichment technologies, you know, those uh, centrifuges and all, in under the Natanz, in the Natanz facility under a mountain and all that. And the, the entire nuclear deal was designed to prevent Iran from going nuclear and giving them certain incentives not to do that. The nuclear deal collapsed many years ago. Maybe they have gone ahead with the enrichment program and they may have sufficient uranium by now, the, the enriched form of uranium, weapons-grade uranium, to have a few nuclear bombs. In the, if that is true, then we have two nuclear powers, two undeclared nuclear powers. If they go to war, it's like all bets are off, you know? Yeah. Can you pull up the map of the Gulf? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, no, that, that one's fine. That one's good. Uh, okay, so Israel on their right is... Jordan, Iraq, and then Iran. So for Iran to actually take on Israel or vice versa, you would have to cross all these countries. Yeah. Israel's not going to be able to cross all these countries. They may be able to. They may be able to. They can. Do you think they'd be able to cross Jordan? Look, Israel, I believe, has F-35s, which is a stealth fighter. F-35s. They also have F-16s, which are a decent fighter. They can fly low or they could hack into the defenses of these nations, the radar defenses, if it's possible. Maybe it's possible. And just fly through and do it at night. No one sees. No one knows what happened. If your radars aren't active, you will not know what happened. It happens, you know, it, it's possible to do that. So they have good aircraft. They have good tactics. They have good strategies. They could be able to reach Iraq, Iran. The Israelis could. It's a matter of half an hour, maybe a couple of hours, maybe an hour or so. Hmm. Supersonic speeds, you know. When, when you see this map as hmm. a geopolitical observer, what do you feel? 
<laughs> it's it's a loaded chess board over here it's a loaded chess board every nation is like very uh, certain nations like saudi arabia oman the uae they desire peace they do not want any conflict they want development they have so much money they want to use it to further the nation and have a great future but then you have the situation the israel versus the arab nations situation has been around since the 1940s maybe before that maybe before that and then you have then you have the iran versus saudi arabia angle as well because one is a shia nation one is a sunni nation these two nations are at longer heads the saudis are scared of iran the iranians are scared of saudi arabia saudi arabia has this massive military they have this massive military budget they acquire so many so much weaponry and etc all that from the us the iranians have russia and china on their side what who knows what they are acquiring Ooh. so yeah it's it's a dangerous situation at the best of times over here hmm <sighs> I remember on one of our past podcasts, we tried breaking down what the actual cause of war is on a primal level, mm-hmm. and it almost always boils down to either religion or acquiring more land slash resources, mm-hmm. right? Um, the religion part I understand, you know, one sect versus another, one religion versus another. What about this other side, land and resources? That has to be an angle. If not for the Gulf countries, then for the countries. Which are bigger geopolitical powers? Hmm. America, Russia, China. Uh, do you want to talk about that from an Israel-Gaza uh, conflict standpoint? Because I think at this point everyone knows, just like the Ukraine and Russia war, it's not just two countries at war. That is just not how wars have happened in the last five hundred years, two hundred years at least. I, have I said something wrong? No, you have not. So one has to understand these conflicts in the in the larger scheme of things the, the global scale so if you look at the globe as a whole there is one dominant power right now the empire the us empire which is nothing but a continuation of the british empire which occupied india for 200 years so in let's say in 1958 let's say the capital of the empire moved from london uk to washington dc that's what happened but the entity is the same it's the same empire so they control the world via what they call the rules based world order and via their extensive military capabilities so the us is the only superpower my definition of the of the term superpower means a nation or an entity that can intervene militarily anywhere in the world at 60 minutes notice only the us can do that china or russia cannot do that of course they can send missiles but that's not the point hold and occupy and, and control Uh, as opposed to just destroy so the only the us can do it and the americans have military bases all across the world including the middle east japan is under permanent us military occupation so is south korea there are more than 130 permanent us military bases in japan maybe close to 100 or maybe more than 100 in south korea lots of bases across the middle east you could say israel is an american outpost or maybe you could argue the other way around is the truth whatever it is right so all of this and if you look at the lines on the map If you look at the Middle East, the lines that divide nations, these are typically straight lines. Human political boundaries never evolve like that. These are artificially drawn straight lines on maps. Somebody set, took a map and drew lines on them. But what that does is it divides communities, it divides divides ethnicities, it divides religions, puts wrong the the wrong people that don't belong together together in a nation which causes civil wars and that's actually perhaps and you see the same thing in africa africa has this history of civil war after civil war which actually is great if you want to neo colonize the country and control it from far mm. so all of these conflicts look if you look at the history of the past 500 years most of the conflicts have been driven by the west initiated by the west or exploited by the west initiated and sustained by the west okay so that's how it is so this is what we are seeing right now is nothing but a legacy of colonialism if you look at how these uh, nations were created you know the trucial state i'm not going to that but you know these blinds of the map how they emerged in the, in the middle east for example this was all done by the western powers mainly the british the french had some involvement in all that okay there was a division turkey was uh, supposed to be carved out by the western powers didn't work 1920s a long story so what are the your question boils down to what are the triggers for war what are the causes for conflict war is nothing but the culmination of a conflict but conflicts can simmer for a long time without actually going kinetic and ballistic so for example there is this frozen civil war that we have in the subcontinent india pakistan hmm. what is the cause of that right there are religious causes there are there are geopolitical causes 
the British exploited, they created, accentuated and exploited religious divisions within India, within ancient India, the subcontinent, partition India, the way they wanted it, and they favored one side over another and used what is temporarily the nation of Pakistan as a potent counterbalance to India and also as a geopolitical staging point for intrusion into the central into Central Asia, Afghanistan and so on. So, and, and that was done by the British, but it's been continued by the Americans. I mean, I would not be wrong at all to say that the Americans funded and financed Pakistani terrorism in India for several decades. Okay, that is absolutely 100% a fact. So that's what they've done. They've created conflicts, they've instigated conflicts, and they've sustained those conflicts and exploited those conflicts for personal gain. And that's what we are saying over here. So there are so many causes for conflict, but it's typically, it boils down to human nature, to the basest of human desires. What do we want? What, I mean, if you were a caveman, what would you want? You want more power. You want more people to obey you. You want more territory, more resources, more money. You want more, more, more. And we humans, uh, at the end of the day, are a violent species. Look at our closest cousins, the chimpanzees, brutally violent. Now, we have something called culture and civilization that kind of holds us back. Some of us do, <laughs> some of us don't. But yeah, that's how it goes. So yeah, there are so many causes, but it's it all boils, boils down to greed, the desire to control more and more and to essentially own the own world. Uh, long ago, when we had one of the first conversations, I said geopolitics is a sport. The, the objective is world domination and there are no rules. You make up rules as, as you go. That's how it goes. If you enjoyed this clip from the Ranveer Show, we've uploaded a ton of other clips related to a ton of other topics. So explore the channel because there's something for everyone.